So anyway, digging on into our Mark chapter 11 study here this morning, uh, keep in mind as we're studying through this text that we are in these final days of Jesus' earthly ministry. Um, We have six or so chapters left to go um, of Mark, uh, which might seem like it would represent a lot of time in Jesus' life, but um, this is the final days before his uh, crucifixion. Um, and to this point, he's already been explaining this to his disciples, um, telling them what was coming. The disciples, understandably, had a difficult time with it. And in chapter 10, Jesus warned his disciples that he was, he was quite specific, that he was headed toward crucifixion at the behest of the Jewish religious authorities and at the hands of the, the Gentiles. Um, last Sunday, of course, was our, our Christmas Eve service so it was two Sundays ago go that we wrapped up chapter 10 and left off with Jesus headed to Jerusalem. Uh, Jesus and his disciples were headed south along the flood plain of the Jordan River as if to uh, reach the Dead Sea, but passing through the region of Jericho and cutting across up to Jerusalem. There were also multitudes of people following along with him. There on his way as he was leaving Jericho, uh, Bartimaeus, a blind man, heard him passing by and cried out to him for, for his eyes to be opened. Um, what he shouted was remarkable. Um, he used that messianic phrase, son of David. Son of David indicates uh, that they acknowledge Jesus as Messiah. The, the reason the title of son of David is a uh, reference back to the prophecy of the, the seed of David in Second Samuel chapter 7. Now that prophecy anticipated the future Messiah that would come from the lineage of David. There was an earlier incident recorded in the Gospel of Matthew back in chapter chapter 9 of the Gospel of Matthew involving two blind men calling Jesus by the same messianic title, Son of David, which is very interesting when you consider the later statement made by Paul that we walk by faith and not by sight. Using that title... To call out to him meant that they believed Jesus to be that promised Messiah from God. It seemed to indicate that while they could not see Jesus, they heard about him and his works and believed. As we're approaching the crucifixion and the resurrection, I think it's important that we take a moment to consider the simplicity of the gospel that makes it appear foolish to those who are wise in their own eyes. Writing the Corinthians, Paul said, I fear lest somehow, as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Certainly he was, though, speaking to believers. He was speaking about living for Christ and simplicity of living that unburdened life because Jesus has taken our burdens. But we talked a few weeks ago about that term, eternal life. And how every time we read that in Scripture, it may not mean what we assume. Our tendency is to to quickly assume that it it means salvation. Um, But it is not necessarily that every single time it's used. The phrase was often used to speak of life from this point forward, uh, meaning living a good, uh, satisfying life, which may or may not include the next age. So then if we assume that every mention of eternal life means salvation, we could be creating something from the text that was not intended to be there. Um, A problem among many teachers today um, is this very thing, and it creates and upholds some some really bad doctrine. Now, we should be very cautious, then, with this term, salvation. That is a term that can mean many different things, from deliverance from physical danger, um, preservation in danger, to deliverance from spiritual danger. And to assume that every appearance of the word salvation, or someone being saved, in Scripture means that they are saved to eternal life, can also create confusion that generates a very flawed understanding. Now, we don't see either of these things necessarily in our text uh, from last, from two weeks ago or today, but when we read that phrase from, from chapter 10 and verse uh, 51, Lord, that I may receive my sight, and then Jesus' Jesus's response, go your way, your faith has made you well, It's possible for us to read into that, that Bartimaeus was made to see spiritually as well as physically. And we just don't have that from the text. We do know that having received his sight, he followed Jesus on the road, which again, we should 
be careful about not reading more into than what we have there. But um, So we know that Bartimaeus physically followed Jesus after having received his sight, after having called out to Jesus as um, the son of David. Now, in our text, we find ourselves in the final part of Jesus' earthly ministry, marked by his final entry into Jerusalem. This was uh, the Passover time. When King Josiah reinstated the Passover, instead of the head of the household sacrificing the lambs, they were now brought to the temple where the priest would perform the sacrifice and then distribute the lambs. The Passover, you may remember, was instituted by God uh, back in Exodus chapter 12 and was to be celebrated continuously. Um, There we read, you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons forever. Now, a little more than uh, 1,500 years before Jesus this was, the Jewish people were being held in slavery by the the Pharaoh of Egypt. God uh, had sent Moses as his vessel to lead Israel out of Egypt. And despite a series of plagues that God sent, Pharaoh had hardened his heart and refused to let loose the Israelites. So the final plague would be the death of the firstborn of every family in Egypt. The only way a family could escape was to slaughter a lamb and to mark the top, the sides, and the bottom of their door with blood. In doing so, it was thought that the blood created a prophetic, perhaps, picture of the cross. Now, the Passover feast was to be celebrated as a reminder and testimony to the children of the goodness of God. Why? Because the people very quickly forget. And that's not the only reason. In John 8, Jesus was having an exchange with those who believed. uh, They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you'll be made free? Isn't that quite interesting? They say they have never been in bondage to anyone, except, of course, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, and the Assyrians. But most important, of course, to the Israelites at that particular time was their slavery in Egypt and their rescue by God. Of course, we can't forget that they were at that time also under the yoke of Rome. Now, how could they have forgotten all of these things? Or had they? Perhaps it was just convenience. But they had. I know that's not really an answer. Strangely enough, it seems to be an answer all the more anyway. And uh, if you know yourself um, as I know you, and if you know me as I know myself, if we know one another, um, and if you have ever had kids, you know people forget things easily. Very, very easily. Moses, when instructing Israel, made this prediction. He said, when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I think we've all known someone whom God has blessed so much that they forget God. Um, Perhaps you yourself have been in that situation. Perhaps you know someone who has. Um, It sounds ridiculous, and yet it is exactly what we do. Sometimes it only takes the distraction of one really good gift. Suddenly the gift gets all the attention, and the giver of the gift is forgotten. It doesn't mean a a born-again believer has lost eternal life, but it does mean that discipline is likely on the way. But the Passover was much more than a reminder of the goodness of God to Israel. It was a foreshadowing of the sacrifice of the true Passover lamb for the whole world. That is Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of Passover, who by his one sacrifice took care of the sin issue for the whole world. So it was Passover time, and Jerusalem and the whole surrounding area would have been very crowded, perhaps overcrowded, with pilgrims. Just how crowded would it have been? Well, some 30 years later at the command of a Roman governor, there was a census that was taken. It was not a census for taxation. It was uh, Cestius Gallus who wanted to convince Nero that the city was strong. The priest, instead of counting people, counted the number of lambs slain in Jerusalem for the Passover. The final number was not far off from 250,000 lambs slain. 
Originally, it was one lamb per family, but Passover regulations eventually became a minimum of 10 persons per lamb. 250,000 lambs slain at Passover means that more than 2,500,000 people would have been there. Those who lived in Jerusalem and its outskirts, but also those who made the pilgrimage in. Now the law was that every adult male who lived within 15 miles of Jerusalem must come to the Passover. But not only the, the Jews of Palestine, Jews from every corner of the world made their way to this greatest of the national festivals. This could not have been a more apt time for Jesus to enter Jerusalem. The city was bursting with expectant people. Now, we should not think that this just fell into place or was some grand coincidence. This was foreordained by God as seen in the aspects of the very feast itself. But Jesus himself certainly also was able to participate and make the arrangements as needed. The whole tone, <coughs> excuse me, the whole tone of the text and the parallel text of Matthew, Mark, uh, or Matthew, Luke, and John um, is that Jesus was carrying out plans that were made in advance. Greater plans made thousands of years earlier, and smaller details arranged by Jesus to keep the scheduled appointment of the cross. Now, I'm sure we'll be dividing this text into multiple weeks. There's a whole lot here. So let's get going. First, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this new morning. We thank you for the breath you have placed in our lungs, for the beating of our hearts. You are truly the living God, compassionate, merciful, slow to anger. You abound in steadfast love. Um, Lord, we pray for those who are sick, um, those uh, uh, who are in, in desperate need of healing, um, uh, the, the children who are sick, the young ones, the um, Lord, the, those who are, are suffering the very many various things that are, are going around right now, Lord. Um, pray for his son, um, that, that you would heal him, Lord. We pray for Larry as well, and, and, and uh, Krista, that you would um, uh, be with them as, as they mourn the loss of, of their daughter and um, others who are uh, currently enduring difficulty, trial, and, and uh, various things in this world. Lord, we lift all these things up to you um, and uh, confidently uh, rest assured knowing that they are in your hands. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so starting with verse 1, it says, Now, when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, and we're going to take this all in one large gulp here real quick, go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered into it, or entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood, who stood there said to them, What are you doing, loosing the colt? And they spoke to them, just as Jesus had commanded, so they let them go. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road. And others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and, to all, and into the temple. Um, so when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Alright, so in our verse-by-verse study, we are really getting into the nitty-gritty of the text. Jesus is headed to Jerusalem, the ultimate Passover sacrifice, the fulfillment of the Passover. He sent his disciples into the village to co collect a donkey and her foal. The text says as they drew near Jerusalem, they were at the Mount of Olives, Jesus told his disciples to go into a village. Mark and Luke mention Bethany or Bethania. Um, Matthew mentions Bethphage. 
So two villages mentioned, which one would have been the village that was opposite the disciples? Well, to start with, the word translated opposite can also be translated ahead or uh, in your view, which of course doesn't tell us a whole lot, but Matthew informs us that they were at Bethphage, so then it stands to reason that the village opposite them was a village that they were not currently in, and that is Bethany. Bethany on the Mount of Olives was a village that was about two miles east of Jerusalem. And of course, uh, nearby then to Bethphage. The Gospels indicate that Jesus visited Bethany quite a bit when he was in this area. We know that Jesus was in this area on occasion earlier in his ministry as seen in the other Gospels. And of course, we would expect that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus would be there. During this final part of his earthly ministry, Jesus would come to Bethany several times. It was here that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, as recorded uh, not, not in Matthew or Mark, but in John 11. Um, it was prior to the events of our chapter, as Jesus made his way to Jerusalem, that Jesus raised Lazarus. And it was after that that the chief priests and the Pharisees made plans then to kill Jesus. Now, as we have seen in Um, Mark, they had already determined to destroy Jesus, but now they were putting together their plans. The Gospel of of, uh, Matthew informs us that there were two animals. There was a donkey, and then there was the donkey's colt. The text there reads this way. It says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and... Immediately, immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord has need of them and immediately he will send them. Now, I know this, this could possibly be upsetting to some who feel that it is absolutely necessary to assume that Jesus was prophesying that the donkey and colt would be there in the village. But it is neither evident nor impossible to say from the text that Jesus had not prearranged that the donkey and her foal should be waiting for him. It is established that Jesus had friends in Bethany. And just the night before this, there was a celebration in Bethany with friends, and Mary had anointed Jesus' feet. And it most certainly makes sense that knowing the plan of the Father, he would have taken steps to prepare as necessary. But the text here also reads as if Jesus is predicting what the disciples would find in Bethany. However, one would think that he would also then know um, for sure if someone was going to question them. Um, And that is certainly what happened. And thinking about it that way makes it sound as if Jesus had likely just made these arrangements beforehand. So I don't think we can say for sure either way. And it's certainly not a problem if he did make arrangements for these animals to be available. What we need to do is go with the plain word of the text and try not to add assumptions onto it and not be offended if the plain meaning of the text goes against what we had perhaps been told previously that it means. The attitude about Scripture that is like that, it goes a long way in helping us to understand, um, not to be confused, and not to create doctrine that is problematic. If Jesus had made the arrangements ahead of time, um, does that create a problem with the prophecy of Zechariah 9 being fulfilled? That is, that making arrangements for prophecy to be fulfilled is maybe perhaps in conflict with the fulfillment of prophecy itself. It might seem like it would be problematic, except for the prophecy depended on a lot more than arrangements being made for a donkey and a colt. It depended on all the other prophecies coming true that came before it. Many of those prophecies, there's no way that they could have been fulfilled by anyone trying to make any kind of arrangements. Yet there is the participation of man that we see in their fulfillment. The prophecy being fulfilled was from Zechariah 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Um, A couple of things about Zechariah 9, verse 9. 
First, it is a messianic prophecy. Second, the Hebrew word for salvation in Zechariah 9 is Yesha, um, which is a shortened version of Yeshua, Jesus' name, which is a shortened version of Yehoshua, um, Joshua's name. Third, it sets up a very interesting contrast. You see, whenever Roman rulers and kings um, would ride into uh, town in a victory parade, they would ride on a large horse with guards and soldiers surrounding them. But Jesus, we see, rides in on a young donkey. This was in line with the traditions of the area and time. In Israel, leaders rode horses if they rode to war, but donkeys if they came in peace. And Jesus' entry into Jerusalem reflected his first coming, which was in peace to die for sins. But we know from Revelation 19 that Jesus will return to conquer and he will return on a white horse. Now our text here in verse 2 gives us the added detail that the donkey had never been ridden before, a fact that made it especially suitable for um, sacred purposes. This is in line with scriptures about other things with uh, special sacredness. For instance, the red heifer used in the ceremonies of of cleansing was to be an animal on which a yoke has never come. The cart on which the Ark of the Lord was carried had to be a vehicle which had never been used. And with this riding of the colt by Jesus into Jerusalem, um, the special sacredness of the occasion was underlined by the fact that the donkey had never been ridden by anyone before. Now, colt here is, is the same word that you would expect to find for foal, um, so you see other, other translations may use foal or even uh, young donkey. So Jesus and his disciples, they're at Bethphage, and the two whom he sent have returned then with the donkey and the colt. Um, which two disciples did he send? We don't know. None of the text actually gives us the names, but that's, the, uh, that's not the only duo that we might be wondering about. The other duo, duo that we might be wondering about is Uh, The two we've been talking about, the donkey and the foal. How could Jesus ride both a donkey and a young donkey at the same time? And yeah, I know Mark does not mention the second donkey, but the text of Matthew 21 verse 7 says that they laid their clothes on them and set him on them. So here's the thing. It is likely that the donkey and the foal are spoken of as being one unit because they were tied together, probably with the elder donkey then in the lead. It was typical of the day that a foal would be kept with its mother even while the mother is used in work. So then as the text of all the Gospels indicates, Jesus rode in on the colt into Jerusalem. Now, as I said earlier, the city of Jerusalem would have been overflowing with people during this time of Passover. It's not doubted that people would come to Jerusalem for the feast. It's so well documented that even to deny it would be absolutely foolish. There's, no, there, there's archaeological evidence that we find of these pilgrimage feasts when people would crowd into Jerusalem um, because that was where the, the uh, temple was located. One such evidence is known as the uh, Theodotus uh, inscription. It is inscri- it's an inscribed tablet or a sign that was found in a cistern in Jerusalem. Um, it com- commemorates the rebuilding of a synagogue in Jerusalem by Theodotus, son of Vetinus. Uh, the synagogue fun- functioned while the temple was still standing, so this item is prior to 70 AD. The Greek inscription references accommodating those who had been abroad, which suggests that the synagogue was largely intended uh, for Jewish pilgrims. These pilgrims would have been those who were just traveling and those who were in the city for, for uh, one of the pilgrimage feasts. Other excavations in Jerusalem have uncovered stone steps uh, belonging to the, the pilgrimage road that connected the Pool of Siloam with the temple. Uh, the Pool of Siloam was a freshwater uh, pool in Jerusalem that functioned as a, a ritual bath or a mikvah. Now, Jesus was moving forward toward that sacrifice as the true Passover lamb toward the very real cross on which he would bear the penalty for all of the sins of the world. His route had already taken him, his disciples and the multitudes that had followed with him from Jericho along a southern uh, route to Bethany, to Bethpage, Bethany, and finally to Jerusalem. It, this was not an easy road. 
In fact, it was a famously dangerous road, dangers which were noted in the uh, story of the Good Samaritan. Having then mounted this foal, now his route would have been from Bethpage on the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem, which was, that was a distance of only a, a few miles. His path into Jerusalem would cross then through the Kidron Valley. And of course, Passover sacrifices were not happening yet, but this was not the last time um, in this series of chapters that Jesus would pass through this valley. The temple was set up on the mount next to the Kidron Valley, and the blood from the sacrifices would then drain through a system of ducts out of the temple and into the stream that ran through the Kidron. Um, the well-known historian Josephus uh, recorded that the stream would turn red with the blood of the Passover lambs. So when Jesus crossed over to go to the Garden of Gethsemane later, he would have stepped over that blood-red stream. Uh, we'll talk some more about that when we get to a later chapter. Now, sometimes I like to uh, throw some things in that might not be directly applicable, a- applicable, a- a- applicable, bubble, bubble, but are really cool nonetheless, I think. And, and this is something I'm reminded of nearly every time I uh, ride an elevator. Not an escalator, an elevator. And since we're speaking of, not that it matters, but <laughs> since we're speaking of God's miracles and the, the wonder of Him in our lives, I want to show you something that's really cool. Um, and maybe uh, when you are at an elevator and see the uh, little fire symbol there, um, perhaps you'll share in the same reminder as well. In 1 Kings eight twenty-eight through 30, it says, Yet regard the prayer of your servant and his supplication, O Lord my God, and listen to the cry and the prayer which your servant is praying before you today, that your eyes may be open toward this temple night and day, toward the, the place of which you said, My name shall be there, that you may hear the prayer which your servant makes toward this place, and may, and may you hear the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel when you pray toward this place, here in heaven, your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. Teaching through the Bible verse by verse um, is such a blast because it's like, it's, it's like exploring in a, a gold mine. Everywhere you turn, um, there's, there's a, a nugget that perhaps you had not noticed before. Um, in that first king scripture, God says, my name shall be there. Um, now, certain, certainly the name of God in Scripture speaks of several things. And of course, God is called by different names in Scripture. A couple of examples. Yahweh, Hira from uh, Genesis 22 means God will provide. El Shaddai from uh, Genesis 49, uh, which means God Almighty. And there are many more names by which God is called in Scripture. But the, the name can also mean authority and presence. Orthodox Jews and, and, and even uh, some more liberal Jews will not speak the name of God or even write uh, God, G-O-D. Instead, they, they write something like G underscore D, or they will say Hashem, um, which means the name in Hebrew. Um, sometimes they will even use the first letter uh, of Shem, uh, the Shin, which is, is that letter to refer to God, which in Hebrew looks like a, a rounded W and it is called the, the Shin, or, or some people pronounce it the Sheen. So Shin became... Uh, for Israel, a visual representation of the name of God. Um, it's also an abbreviation for Shaddai, um, God, the ultimate power over all. Now, this is really cool. Um, we have a map of Jerusalem we can throw up there, and there are three valleys that run through the land. Uh, on the eastern side of the Temple Mount is the Kidron Valley, running uh, up right next to the western side of the Temple Mount, under what is known as the Robinson's Arch, and separating Mount Moriah from Mount Zion is the Tripolian uh, Valley. And just a little further off to the west, uh, on the other side of the Mount Zion, is Gehenna Valley. Um, these three valleys join together to the south and under the, the old city of David, forming a letter Sheen, or, or Hashem, the name, uh, the name of God, perhaps written on the land. Now, I'm sure that there are many places around this earth where there are three valleys that converge in this very same manner. Does that mean that God has written his name on, uh, on there as well? Well, God himself has said that he has written his name on Jerusalem. Um, at the same time, it's, it's fine for us to see that form in various things, such as uh, I might see if I was approaching an elevator panel and be reminded that God is indeed great. Now, as Jesus heads into Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, 
This very great crowd has gathered to receive him. They lay their cloaks on the way, while others place branches from trees on the road. The Gospel of John tells us that these were palm fronds. Placing their cloaks on the, ground, on, on the road symbolized their submission to Jesus. Um, that seemed to make sense. The, the palm fronds is a, a little more difficult to figure out, but there are some extra biblical sources, namely 1st 2nd Maccabees, that show Judas Maccabeus and his followers when they recovered Jerusalem and, and the temple, they waved palm branches. Um, in fact, many coins of that particular era um, contained an uh, image of palms. Nations tend to, to put things in their coinage that, that represent the, the nation in and, and, and positive aspects of the nation, um, especially uh, victory or victorious times. So then from this information, it's not hard to understand from Maccabees and other sources that palms represented uh, Jewish nationalism and, and victory. So what does this mean? Well, it means that these crowds were not necessarily receiving Jesus as the Passover lamb. They were receiving Jesus as the one they hoped would lead Israel to national prosperity and to dominance. The Gospel of Matthew refers to crowds that went ahead of him and crowds that followed behind him. Same here in Mark. John's Gospel refers uh, or, or helps us to better understand this whole picture. Crowds come, up, come out from Jerusalem to greet Jesus. These were Apparently, those pilgrims in Jerusalem for the Passover who have heard of Jesus' miraculous deeds and his healings, especially perhaps of Lazarus, which was very recent. Um, We know from John 12 that there were those who were caught up in an expectation of what was to come. They met Jesus on the road and they they turned around to form a procession. And, And those who are accompanying Jesus from Bethpage as well, including his disciples uh, followed from behind. Now you might wonder who, who else might be in this crowd. Well, Luke tells us that there were many of Jesus' own disciples. These would have been the disciples uh, beyond just the 12. We know he had many more disciples than that. Uh, also among the larger group were the women who followed Jesus from Galilee, including Mary Magdalene, uh, Mary the mother of James and John and so forth. There were also believers in the uh, Jerusalem region. Among those probably would have been Lazarus, um, Martha, and Mary, and others who John says in chapter 12 of his gospel believed when Jesus uh, raised Lazarus. Also within this large crowd were those who were more typical of the crowds that followed Jesus through his ministry. They had their own expectations Uh, Many, as I said earlier, expecting Jesus to liberate Jerusalem and the the people of Israel from their Roman oppression. And certainly, as there is in any crowd, some were there just out of curiosity. Um, Perhaps caught up in the excitement or there to see what all the excitement was about. In the Gospel of Luke, we find that the crowd also has some religious leaders keeping watch on him and demanding that he rebuke his disciples. So why is that? Why would they demand that he rebuke his disciples? Um, The crowds were shouting, Hosanna. Hosanna is composed of two Hebrew elements, Hosha and Na. Um, Hosha meaning save or help, and Na means please. So essentially they were calling out, save please, O son of David. Um, It was a liturgical expression of praise with origins going back to Psalm 118, as Matthew indicates in in verse 9 of his chapter. However, considering their expectations of Jesus being the immediate messianic king, their expression of Hosanna was more like hail to the king. The crowds at this point believe that every messianic expectation is now at the point of realization. Jesus will soon claim the throne and save them out of their oppression. Luke 19 informs us that the Pharisees that were watching demanded then that Jesus rebuke his disciples. Well, why were the Pharisees concerned? Well, there was certainly an element of jealousy. Jesus had the crowds and the attention of the people, and they were envious and and suspicious of his popularity as they had been for so long now. Also, as we have seen in our study through uh, Matthew and now Mark, Jesus often exposed them and, and called out their problems. 
They feared that Jesus would cause a revolt against Rome that would lead to Rome clamping down harder on Israel, even perhaps destroying Israel. And they recognized that this great multitude were looking at Jesus as the soon-to-be king. I find it interesting that even though the crowds did not understand the significance of the words that they were calling out, Jesus says that if the crowds did not call out, at least in Matthew he says this, that the, 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 uh, the stones would, would call out. The rolling stones are old, but I don't think they're that old. Jesus was speaking of the stones on the ground. And probably the stones of the temple and the stones of the city. It was likely a proverb of imminent judgment from God, perhaps drawing from the stone crying out in Habakkuk 2. And Luke also records that as he drew near to the city, he wept over it. He said, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes, for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you, close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now Mark's account, account is more abrupt. But Matthew elaborates and says that all Jerusalem was disturbed. And this is the second time the Gospels tell us that the city of Jerusalem was disturbed. The first was when the wise men came seeking the one born King of the Jews. And now as Jesus enters Jerusalem, we see that the whole city is once again moved. Which doesn't sound like a bad thing, but the Greek word means stirred. And for this reason, the ESV says that the city was stirred up, while the the New English translation says the city was thrown into an uproar. Who is this? Was the question that was being asked all over the city, as would naturally be the question for anyone who was seeing this. Especially with all the shouting of expectation. And the crowds who were proceeding and following Jesus answered generally, this is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. For three years, Jesus had traveled through Israel, proclaiming himself to the nation in word, deed, and in miracles. He was known by many, but remember that there were people in Jerusalem who had pilgrimaged from many foreign places for the Passover. So then there were several groups who were here witnessing all of this. There were the religious leaders who hated Jesus. There were the secret disciples among the religious leaders who secretly loved Jesus. There were the pilgrims who had never heard of Jesus. There were the faithful few disciples who were with Jesus, unsure of what was to happen, but with Jesus no matter what happened. And then there were the throngs of people expecting Jesus to claim the throne. But Jesus has undertaken a different kind of triumphal entry from what many of the crowd expected. Jesus was going to triumph over the enemy of sin. He will bring salvation to people through his righteous sacrifice on the cross. But the people in Jerusalem during this could also be put into two other groups. Easily Jews and Gentiles. And regarding These two groups and the salvation he won for both, Paul wrote to the Ephesians, He himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. There are many Jews and Gentiles who will soon believe. But that is looking ahead. For now the Israelites cry out, Hosanna, Yah, Hashanna, Yah. But soon they will cry out, crucify him. And Jesus knows this. And so we find Jesus in Luke, weeping over the city. 
Jesus knew that his death had already been determined by the religious leaders after he had raised Lazarus from the dead just a few miles outside of Jerusalem. John records that the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together in a council decrying the quandary that they saw themselves in. And Caiaphas had said, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people. And not that the whole nation should perish. Jesus was headed toward the sacrifice. Many people thought that the time had come for Jesus to to deliver them from foreign government bondage. But this was leading to the fulfillment of a necessarily first prophetic fulfillment. Incidentally, Jesus would enter through the eastern gate. Also called the golden gate at this time. The old city of Jerusalem was surrounded by a wall containing eight gates. There was uh, Herod's gate, there was the Damascus gate, the New Gate, Jaffa gate, Zion gate, the Dung gate. Nobody wanted to go through the Dung gate. There was the Eastern gate. There was the Lion's gate. The Eastern gate, what a horrible name for a gate. Who wants to? (laughs) The Eastern gate was the gate which faced the Mount of Olives, which was across the Kidron Valley. Its actual Hebrew name was was Sha'ar Hara Hamim, meaning gate of mercy. So then, in this triumphant entry, we have the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world entering into Jerusalem in the Passover season through the mercy gate. Let's end here and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the amazing, wonderful things you have done in our lives. We thank you for your love that you have revealed to us, for the love that we share together as your body. Um, Lord, we pray for the words that you have sown into our hearts today through your written word. Lord, we ask you would watch over them, protect them. May they take root. May they produce wonderful things that glorify you and that Uh, and that share the the love of Christ with others and the truth of Christ with others. Lord, um, show us if there is sin in our lives that we need to confess and if there is anyone um, that we need to ask forgiveness of. Um, We also ask that that you would teach us how to be quick to forgive others as, as we ourselves have been forgiven, each one of us, of so much. We ask that you would help us as we endure the hardships of of this current era, that we would glorify you in all our troubles. Help us to consider one another, that we may not stumble anyone, but that we lead others to you. And as we leave here this morning, as we move forward into whatever this new week holds for each of us, We ask that you would reveal your grace, your truth to us day by day. That you would guard our hearts and keep our minds and our hands from evil. That you would protect us from the deceptions of our enemy, the devil. Thank you for being our great high priest. Lord, we place ourselves before you to do your will. We ask that you would lead us in victory. Use us to spread knowledge of Jesus Christ to all the world. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May He make His face and His light to shine upon you. May He lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace, His shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, that's Jesus the Messiah, our Lord and our Savior, and everyone said, Amen. The object of of faith is not the gospel, my friend. The object of faith is Jesus. Being at peace with God is is not automatic because you by nature are separated from God. The Bible says, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. You and I, we are both sinners. Every person is a sinner and sin, our sin, separates us from God. Sincerity, morality, good works, a religion, These are some of the ways that man has tried to close the gap between himself and God. Only God's love can close that gap of separation between himself and you. He paid the penalty for the sins of 
the world. The Bible says, He Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By His wounds you have been healed. But the good news is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as John the Baptist said, is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Apostle reiterated this in 1 John 2, where we read this, And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Because of this, despite the fact that we are sinners, we are not blocked from God and from His kingdom because of our sin. He has removed the sin barrier so that now we are all savable. All we need to do to have everlasting life with God. Life that can never be lost is to believe in Jesus Christ. As Jesus said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus very plainly says that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but has everlasting life. Because of the cross and the, the resurrection of Jesus, all who simply believe in Him have everlasting life and will one day be raised from the dead to live physically forever in perfect, glorified bodies. I can be absolutely sure that I have everlasting life because I know it has nothing to do with how good or bad I am and everything to do with Jesus' faithfulness to His promise. You cross that bridge into God's family when you believe in Jesus Christ and God invites you to believe and freely receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life that can never be lost.